Well, hello there, everybody. Um, again, we are here on a Tuesday night for some free training. And after I'm done here, don't forget, I've started doing something new and I've started offering certificate of attendance or completion for anyone that might need that for school or for work. So go into the comments when I'm done and check that out and you'll be able to just download that PDF that you can um, print off on your own. So thank you for being here today um, up here in on the Wisconsin Minnesota border. It is very cold. It was like a minus 27 wind chill this morning. Um, hi Lisa from Olympia. Yeah, you guys let me know where you're watching from. Um, is your weather as cold as mine? Minus 27 wind chill. <laughs> I feel like I just keep talking about it, but up north here, like, that's what we do in the winter is talk about how cold it is or how snowy it is. So let me know if you're in a snowy location too, or a cold location. Um, so in the comments, tell me where you're watching from and tell me a little bit about yourself. Are you an educator? Are you a parent, a grandparent? Um, I'm Tara, and I'm the face behind Autism Little Learners, and I help parents and educators of young children with autism by creating materials and resources and offering trainings like this so that you learn the how-to of things or the why of some of the strategies that we use. So I hope these are helpful to you and your staff, your families. Um, all right, I'm going to just look in the comments here. Hi, Christy and Jill, SLP from New Jersey. And Karen, am I saying it right? I saw you last time and I, I'm not sure I'm saying your name right. Karen or Karen um, from Fort Worth. I bet you're a lot warmer than we are here. Um, hi, Shana and Marcy and Nancy. Um, Five-year-old granddaughter, awesome. All right, I love seeing grandparents here. Hi, Erin from Australia and Holly from Canada. Holly and I were messaging a bit and I love talking to her. Um, all right, so a couple things to get started. Um, this is the last in this kind of series of Facebook Lives and at the end of this live tonight, I'm gonna to tell you another exciting um, free opportunity for education, professional development, training, whatever you wanna call it. But first, I gotta share an awesome story from today and um, I don't know, you guys will understand how exciting this is, okay? So I have a student, so this, okay, I'll back it up. In my school this year, I work with early childhood and have for like the last nine, 10 years. Um, so we have three to five year olds. Uh, my morning class is a CIP class. So it stands for Communication Interaction Program. We mainly have children who have the label of autism and kind of a more intensive class with more hours than a general preschool class. And so this year we decided to add a parent connection day on Fridays or a parent connection piece. Um, so one time a month we will get together with any parents that would like to attend the group, kind of a parent group, and we talk about a topic. And so <clears throat> this fall we've talked a lot about a variety of different visual supports. And um, at our meeting in December, I had a parent come up to me and her child's been with me for a couple years. And it was so awesome because learning about these visual supports, she had this idea and she said, okay, he has not been successful in going to the dentist. So you guys in the comments, let me know, do you have a child that has trouble going to the dentist. I mean, think of all the sensory issues related to going to the dentist and how it's scary for us too as adults sometimes. And so let me know in the comments, do you have a student who has had trouble at the dentist or a child or grandchild? Um, Amanda, yes, this recording will be uh, available later. So a lot of times over the years, parents obviously have trouble with dentist appointments for their autistic child. So this parent, um, she's awesome, and she had learned a lot about visual supports, and she said, could we do something that will help get him past the lobby? Because he could make it into the building, into the lobby, but they could never get him past there. They couldn't get him, obviously, back into a, a room or into a chair. 
And so I said, okay, could you go and take pictures of the exact dentist office you go to so we can do a little story to prepare him? And she's like, yeah, yeah. So she contacted the dental office and they said, hey, we'll take the pictures for you. So they emailed them to her. She emailed them to me and I supplemented with some Google images because I felt like a few of the, the things that he would encounter at the dentist, I really needed to break down a little more. But I'm going to show it to you because we finished this, I think it was before winter break. And so she's been reading this to him for three weeks probably. And they read it, not just like, oh, we're going to read it and go. We're going to prepare ahead of time. So she read it to him and read it to him and read it to him. And he went to the dentist last week and she shared with me today that he did it. <laughs> like this has never happened and he's five now. He went to the dentist, he got in past the lobby. She said he walked right in the room and they had the book with him, sat in the chair and opened his mouth. I'm like, what? Like, you've got to be kidding me. They didn't even ask him to open his mouth. He opened his mouth because he had read the story so many times and he knew that's what the next thing to do was. Holy cow, you guys. And then she said that he, um, as they picked up each instrument, he took their hand and, like, led it to his mouth. Like, what? So social stories and visuals like they're not always a magic fix she put a, a lot of work into prepping him knowing that they could go in there and it maybe wouldn't work this time or maybe you know oh maybe we'll get back to the chair so baby steps so if you're implementing something like this um don't think of it as a failure if it doesn't work. Think of it as you're planting another seed. Like, it would have been great if he just went back and sat in the chair for the count of five and left. And each time, you could add a little something on. So, But the fact that he did the whole thing, like, oh my gosh, it's amazing. So I'm going to show you the story because this is the one I made for her. I don't know if it would apply to dentists in general. Um, Lisa said shows how powerful it is for pre-teaching. Um, so I'm going to show you the story real quick. I know this isn't our topic for tonight, but man, it's such an awesome win. And I knew you guys would understand it. So I had to share it with you. So this was the story. This is not him and the story. Um, these were different Google images and then the pictures that they sent of the office. So it's just kind of laying out each step. It's kind of a story. Um, not a social story in the sense, in the true sense where you get into their feelings and stuff like that, but it's a story that just kind of lays out the steps of what to expect. So then it talks about going to the desk, sitting in the waiting area. When it's my turn, I'll walk down the hall. And so that's a picture from the hall at that dentist office. Um, next, we'll go in an exam room. And I think it's so important to like show pictures with all those different tools and stuff because you can walk into that and talk about visual sensory overload. Like that's a lot to look at. Um, and then the light. So they might turn on a special light to see my teeth better. And then it's time to open my mouth. And in this picture that I chose, it shows some of the tools in the mouth because that is what we need to do to prepare. Um, the hygienist will clean my teeth with a special tool and it shows and um, then they will floss my teeth. And it's okay if you don't get to each of those things the first time, like I said, like you make it to the chair, that's a win. Um, after the dentist, after that, the dentist will come look at my teeth and then I'm all done and I can say goodbye. So you could individualize this and add in whatever you wanted, but let me know in the comments. Do you think this story in particular would be helpful to any of you, even though it's not your exact dentist um, you could, you know, put in a picture on top of it with, with your dentist office or something. But I can make this available if anybody would like it. So anyway, yay for my student, right? Amazing. And yay for mom for recognizing it, for taking action and making this happen. This was probably 80% her. I just helped make the story and the visuals. 
All right. So, okay. Jody said, I need this social story. We're, we're struggling with the dentist currently. Sue, yes, please. Okay. So I'll get it in the comments for sure after I'm done here tonight. All right. So tonight, the topic is a little bit interesting. Visual supports for a girl with autism. Three tips. All right. So we know, well, I'll go into it. Let me just get started. Um, so should any of the visual supports or strategies be different for autistic girls? What do you think? Have you ever wondered that? Like it's kind of something we don't talk about a whole lot. Um, autistic girls tend to go unidentified or identified later, much later than boys. And from a lot of the research, it kind of says that um, the diagnostic criteria for autism was mainly developed and studied on boys. And so we just apply that same criteria to girls and we have less girls identified. Or later, like why would that be, you know? And so one of the things when I was reading through the research, there were some studies done more recently, like in 2015, 2016, um, and I can get you the articles if you're interested. Um, but one of them, the title is Girls and Boys with Autism Differ in Behavior and Brain Structure. And so basically what this research says is when you're looking at the three areas of autism, communication, social deficits, communications deficits, social deficits, and then you have that repetitive behavior piece. So this study kind of, it looked at boys and girls and it said, they scored similarly in the communication and the social piece, but that repetitive behavior is where there were differences. Did you guys know this? Like, this is kind of newer information for me, and it makes sense. So in the study, it says, um, uh oh, Penny said the live stream froze up. Is anyone else having trouble, or am I good to keep talking? Let me know in the comments. Am I good? I know it like last time went black um, and I had to come back on, but I'm not seeing that on my end. Oh no, Holly, same. Okay, am I going now? Okay, keep going. All right, so I was talking about, um, in case you missed it, I'll recap just a little bit. So the studies show that girls and boys who are autistic score similarly in the areas of communication and social. They both have deficits in those areas that are clearly seen during testing. But the repetitive behaviors and difficulty with impulse control appear more in autistic boys than autistic girls. Now that's interesting, right? So when you're thinking um, the repetitive behaviors, that might be flapping, spinning, rocking. It could be echolalia, that's repetitive language. Um, it could be lining up toys. So all those things are things that we think of in our heads as kind of key indicators of autism, especially in young children. And if they aren't uh, exhibiting those, like if girls aren't exhibiting those, then we may be a little more confused on what the appropriate diagnosis is, right? So if girls aren't doing those as much as boys, is that the reason that they're not coming out um, or being identified early? Or is it truly that more boys have autism? So super duper interesting. And so these studies that I was reading through um, really got me thinking about that. And so that's part of why I wanted to share this with you. The other area that I found really interesting too is they said that girls tend to be, girls who are autistic tend to be better at gestures than boys. And so think of that. If you've done, let me know in the comments, do you do the ADOS test? Like uh, me and the special ed teacher that I um, co-teach with will give the ADOS together. Um, for the educational label as a piece of our testing process. And so they, and in the ADOS, one of the big areas you look at is our gestures. Are they using a variety of gestures? 
in a variety of ways and contexts. And so um, if girls are using gestures better and they're not engaging in as many kind of overt repetitive behaviors, then they're not looking the same as boys. So really interesting. Um, so these indicators of autism can just be easier to spot. Um, the repetitive stuff can be easier to spot than just the difficulties with communication or socializing. And so we have autism pretty steady throughout the last several, many, many years, being four times more prevalent among boys versus girls. So one of the things that you're going to want to do is really look at the differences in how autism affects girls and then tailor their visual supports to those differences. And so one of the ways, um, and this seems really simple, but for years, I don't think I really thought about it. Are girls represented in the pictures, right? I feel like everything with autism, because it is more common in boys or more prevalent in boys, um, we have stick figures, we have pictures and visuals that mainly have boys in them. Um, so one of the things you just want to think about, it doesn't mean when you have a girl, you have to have every picture be of a girl. Like for sometimes with boys, I'll have a picture of a girl, like here, this walking picture. Now I would use that whether it's with a boy or a girl, it's fine. But you just want to make sure that all your pictures aren't boys. You want to be able to um, tailor to the girls so they can see themselves represented in the pictures. And I think this is really important too with girls of color, making sure, because that's another piece that you just want to be thinking of with representation. So just kind of put that in the back of your thinking bubble and the next time you're making materials, just think about it and add a few girls in and then you'll have that um, when you have a girl in your class. Um, Lisa said, a few young girls I've seen who were diagnosed a couple of years later than the male siblings were more withdrawn and less able to transition or cope with change. Yeah, okay, so we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, so it kind of plays into this. So tip two, use visuals to check in more frequently. And this is, like Lisa was saying, the um, withdrawal. So you look at that uh, emotional mental health piece. Um, and so you want to use these visuals to check in more because autistic girls tend to have increased anxiety. And so Lisa's saying shy withdrawn. Okay, you guys, we know enough about this to know that usually is a manifestation of anxiety, right? So are we checking in to help with self-regulation? Um, not self-regulation in like, oh, you need to calm down, but self-regulation and checking in, how are you doing? Um, and with little kids, you know, three and four year olds, you're not going to say, how are you doing today? But it's starting with some of these self-regulation techniques and strategies like, I feel I need, or on this one, I feel I can try. So that's where I found the best um, spot to start. Like we move kids on to zones of regulation stuff when, we, when they're ready. But prior to that, starting with, I feel I need. And so this picture that I have up here, um, I do have some blogs where I talk about it a little more, but I would not start with all these pictures. This is kind of just to display so you can see everything that's on there. But with a young student, I might start with just that right side where there's the white and says, when I feel I can try. And I might have three emotions on there because we're just probably teaching emotions. Happy, sad, mad. Okay, how do you feel? And at first we're modeling it because... They maybe don't understand the pictures yet or don't have that connection to their emotion yet. But, oh, look, you look happy. I wonder if you feel happy. Okay, I feel happy. I can try. And then you have a little choice board 
with some things. And so it's good to not just check in when they're mad. So checking in when things are going well too and let them pick something. It's fine if they pick it when they're happy. But then you could say, oh, you look, I think you're mad. You look mad. I feel mad. I can try. And then they can pick something. Now, I have a little boy in my class right now. He can have like big meltdowns, crying, screaming, and the kind of meltdown where the more you try to talk, the more it's going to ramp him up. He'll try to scream over you. But if you bring one of these I feel I need and you just kind of set it in front of him uh, and say, oh, I think you look sad. Okay, I feel sad. What do you need? And it, he looks and he always picks a fidget toy, like a squeeze ball. He picks that, puts it on there, and he's done. Like it makes him snap out of it. Um, so those are kind of those bigger behaviors that you automatically think self-regulation. But um, you could check in with a girl, especially like Lisa's saying, withdrawn or shy. But check in more frequently, not just when um, like, oh, there's a big meltdown or transition and they're laying on the ground. Check in with girls more frequently throughout the day, even when they maybe seem okay, and see where they're at and see if they need something to help self-regulate. So several times throughout the day. So that's tip number two. Um, tip number three, the social skills. Social skills with girls looks a little bit different. And so you may have heard a lot of um, people talking about it now are saying like girls are better at masking their autism. And I think we hear this from adult autistic women who say, I got really good at masking, pretending, you know, covering up either their traits um, or characteristics or trying to cover up that anxiety, the, the mental health piece. And that takes a lot of energy and a lot of work. And I mean, talk about probably feeling depleted and depressed. Um, so things like social skills, emotions, friendships. Um, girls tend to have deficits or differences, but they have um, a stronger desire to connect with others socially. And so there's, I'm going to read this quote. Um, it was in my blog post this week, but Jane Strauss says, there are a number of things I wish my parents had known and had been able to teach me. These include how to make friends, how to tell if people are really your friends, how to deal with bullies and bullying, and that it is okay to not live in herds. And I think what that says to me is like, you don't have to have a whole bunch of friends. You can have one good friend, right? And Christy says the AIM modules through Ocali um, has a new training on girls in autism. Awesome. I love those modules. And if you don't know about them, I'm going to link them below because um, you need to check them out. They have some good information on a lot of different areas. So um, what this autistic woman is saying, looking back, like, you know, they had, she had a strong desire for friendships, but it's that being naive and not knowing if you're being taken advantage of. And so I think back this up with little learners, we need to start teaching or continue teaching about emotions, basic social skills like practicing, sharing and taking turns and all those things with three and four year olds. But understanding that wanting to connect and trying to coach and facilitate that in happening. Um, those social skills can be taught in a lot of ways. You can start with one-on-one -on -one teaching of some of those skills and move to a group setting, um, parent coaching, video modeling. Um, I think a lot of play-based kind of um, therapy, speech therapy or social skills training, like especially with the young kids, they're not going to learn it by sitting and like learning, okay, when you do this, then you... They should do this, like, like verbally learning the steps. It's more like play-based coaching and using visual supports to support that. So that is the third tip. And what do you guys think? Like, just super interesting stuff in the research. And I can't wait to check out the 
AIM module that Christy talked about. Um, I also have an exciting announcement, so I'm glad you are still here. Some of you maybe saw an ad up, but I have a free webinar coming. And it is, it's coming up in February. There's four different dates. You only have to sign up for one because um, it's the same re one repeated. But a webinar versus Facebook Live, a webinar is even diving even deeper into a topic and it's a little bit longer than one of these Facebook Lives. And so it's not on Facebook. There's a link that you click on to sign up and you'll get reminders in your email and everything. Um, but I'm super excited because I get to talk about one of my favorite things and it's how to create clear, predictable routines to increase engagement. So I'm gonna show you 10 proven visual supports and it's for educators and parents. So this can be used at home or in the classroom with young autistic children to create smoother transitions, predictable routines, increasing engagement, increasing independence. So if you think that that is something that sounds good to you, Scream it from the mountaintops. Um, share, once I give you the link, share it. Um, you guys can use it with staff. You can um, watch this training at home or share it with other parents or groups um, because I can let a lot of people in. You wanna go there and get your seat right away because each night is limited to 150 people. And so you wanna make sure you get that. But I haven't shared this with anybody yet. So thank you for being here still. Um, I'm going to call come full screen so I can show this to you. Um, if you attend the webinar live and you're, you're there watching as I'm teaching, you are going to get this brand new thing for free. So you guys have seen the lanyards. Um, oh, I don't have my lanyard on right now, but you attach it and put your pictures on that you will need during like transitions at school. Parents can use these at home too. These are not just for school. So um, walk, wait, bathroom. So if I'm in the hall and my student um, drops down to the ground, I could use this visual to say, try to see if it will help. Oh, we're gonna walk. And just instead of me saying it, having the visual right there. Um, so there's a whole bunch and you can just pick which ones work for you. Um, more, I mean, there's just a whole bunch. Um, you'll have to see. Yeah, hopefully won't, won't need this for long, but a reminder to mask on. Um, table, like, you know, you're in the classroom. Oh, it's time to go to the table. Or remind, raise hand. That's if you're in elementary. Hands to self. So this is not um, out anywhere yet, but you're going to get it if you come to the webinar live. I'm so pumped. Um, so hold on one second. I'm going to get you more information about that. All right. So these are some of the visuals you guys have heard me talk about, but we're going to go more in depth and I'm going to show you how to use all these. I'm going to see if I can get some videos. We'll see. We'll see how much I can get um, done before the webinar, but I love showing these in action and I'm sure you guys like seeing them in action. So some of you have seen these, but I'm going to go deeper and then I'm going to add some more visual supports that I love. Um, so what you're gonna learn in the webinar, and this is kind of big, um, why visual supports work, how visual supports can reduce frustration and anxiety, why visual supports can increase, or ways visual supports can increase engagement, um, how to use them to help your classroom or home run more smoothly, who doesn't want that, you guys? Give me a thumbs up if you want your classroom to run more smoothly or home. Um, how to assemble and implement some of these and ways to keep it organized because what good are visual supports if you can't keep them organized and handy for when you need them. And then one little thing that we'll also go into, how to get buy-in from all team members. So one of the things I hear people, teachers say is like, I have this great visual support or visual schedule, but people aren't using it. They're not following it, right? Um, same thing can be at home. Um, yeah, I know this works, but we want all our family members to understand why this is so important. 
And so I'm hoping that you walk away from the webinar, um, and you can invite family members too, hoping you walk away with with also some ways to how to get buy-in from other people on why these are important and how to use it. Christy, you're awesome. I don't know where, she says, I don't know where you find the time to put all this together. It's so appreciated. It's some days it's easier than others. Today was a really, so I'm still in the classroom full time. Today was a very, very busy day. And I was like, how am I going to have any energy for tonight? But when you guys comment, you guys, oh, yeah. Uh, just sharing this, like, as I grew as an educator and as a speech language pathologist, I attended so many workshops and learned from so many other people. And now, being able to share is so much easier with this online space. And so I just feel like it is a passion of mine and I want to share it. So thank you for always being here and being so supportive. All right, so I've got to move my little camera here again. Um, these are the dates, February 3rd, 6th, 8th, and 10th. Um, one of those dates, I can't remember offhand, I think it's the 6th, is on a Sunday at like 1 in the afternoon because I'm hoping that will help some of our friends that are overseas or um, in the UK, in Australia, and some of the other places um, have a time to attend. So sign up. You guys can go right now if you want to autismlittlelearners.com forward slash webinar. And I'll also put the link in the comments right when I get off of here. Um, so I hope you all have an awesome night. I'm gonna go through the comments, answer any questions you have, but sign up for the webinar as soon as possible so you get the night you want. Because if like February 3rd fills up, then that won't be an option anymore. So head over and do that. And I guess the first webinar is next week. So I'll see you next week. I'll post about it. You'll get reminders if you sign up and register, all right? And then, I don't know, after that's all done, what's my next series going to be on Facebook Live? Should we talk toileting this spring? Because toileting is a huge one. Let me know. What topics would you like to hear more about? All right, you guys, have an awesome rest of the week, and I'll talk to you soon.